Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the sort of an ESCCT webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of this series on behalf of SIRTUP and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of SIRTUP and ESCCP, followed by the technical portion, which details results from Department of Defense funded research on the utilization of advanced conservation voltage reduction for energy savings at military installations. First, Dr. Cyrus Jabari from Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall will provide a DOD perspective on advanced conservation voltage reduction. His presentation will be followed by a short Q&A session. Second, Mr. Bruce Ensley from Dominion Energy will provide an overview of a related technology demonstration conducted at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. We will conclude the webinar with a longer interactive Q&A session featuring both of our speakers. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast platform. Firefox, IE, or Edge are the most compatible browsers to use. If you lose the content on your screen or if your screen freezes, please try keying Control F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the join join audio button, select test speaker and microphone, and follow the prompt as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, feel free to call into the conference line using the conference call number indicated here on your slide, as well as the required conference ID. Uh, if you continue having issues, submit a comment using the chat box only use the chat box for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You, will, um, you can um, submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of the Q&A session. Uh, when submitting your questions, please make sure to add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Mr. Tim Tetro, who is the ESCCP Project uh, Program Manager for Energy and Water. Before joining CERDIP and ESCCP, Tim worked at the National Renewable Energy Lab where he focused on energy efficiency and renewable energy project development for the federal sector. Tim? Thank you, Rula, and welcome everybody to today's CERDIP ESTCP webinar. I'll be going over a few slides to give some background on the programs and then hand it back over for the technical session. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. It was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between DOD, the Department of Energy, and EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCB are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring in the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale 
although occasionally supported by lab efforts conducted. There are four program areas in CERTIP and five in ESTCP. The Installation Energy and Water Program is, the, is only in ESTCP, while the other four, Environmental Restoration, Munitions Response, Resource Conservation and Resiliency, and Weapon Systems and Platforms, are both CERTIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today focused on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the Installation Energy and Water Program area. Installation Energy and Water has essentially three main areas of research. Smart and secure installation energy management, efficient integrated buildings and components, and distributed generation. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. As you can see, upcoming webinars will cover a broad range of topics, including temporal and spatial scales of non-stationarity uh, temperature and precipitation across the United States, accelerated aging studies in the weapon systems and platforms program area, managing contaminated sediments, unexploded ordnance characterization and detection, roles of soil microbial communities and the control of non-native and invasive species, and restoration of ecosystem functions, and more. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link here. Registration is now live for webinars through the end of the year. I would like to remind you that a copy of the of presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webpage. We'd appreciate it also if you could take, please take a moment to complete a survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. And finally, I am pleased to announce that the CERTIP ESTCP Symposium will be held again this upcoming December in Washington, DC. Three-day event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission to improve environmental and energy performance. Registration information will be available soon on, our CERT, on the CERTIP and ESTCP website. Thank you for joining. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to, to Rula. Thank you, Tim. It is now my pleasure to introduce, to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Cyrus Shabari. Uh, Dr. Shabari is an electrical engineer within the Directorate of Public Works at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. Um, he is responsible for the operational sustainment of the Army garrisons at Fort Myer, Virginia, Fort Leslie McNair in Washington, DC, as well as the Marine Base Henderson Hall in Arlington, Virginia. Among his many duties within the Department of Public Works, Dr. Jabari oversees the ongoing operation of the utility privatization contract with Dominion Energy. That's the project that you're gonna hear about today. Uh, Cyrus is a registered professional engineer in Virginia and holds a doctoral degree in electrical engineering from the Pens Pennsylvania yeah. State University. Cyrus? Uh, hello, uh, it's a pleasure talking to everyone uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, the agenda that I have is today is project rationale and then why is it that uh, uh, Fort Myer was, uh, uh, the, the, was chosen to uh, be a pilot program uh, for this project, then project financing, and then, of course, I'm going to be talking about verification of the results and then monthly voltage performance by the circuits that we have here at Fort Myer, uh, me measurement and verification, and of course, validation by us. Uh, uh, the project rationale is for this. It's the, to reduce the energy usage, reduce energy costs, <clears throat> increase energy efficiency, help the reduction of carbon footprint, uh, footprint, attempt in part to comply with DOD energy policies, obtain data for promoting the concept of CVR at other installations. Why Fort Myer? Uh, the reason we, Fort Myer was, a, uh, uh, was chosen was that, that we had a lot of smart meters in our buildings and utilities. Uh, these smart meters were installed by the Army Corps of Engineers 
in the past uh, several years. And a number of our buildings have smart meters, which we can monitor every second the uh, amount of voltage cons voltages and the uh, currents and the power consumption in each one of our buildings. And of course, another reason we were chosen was the proximity to Department of Defense and Pentagon. Uh, since uh, we are close here, we have a good visibility with the top brass at Pentagon and uh, DOD. Uh, and also, uh, we are also a candidate for the implementation of the concept of base of tomorrow. And this was just the starting point for uh, getting the project base of tomorrow started at uh, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. The project financing was done through the CERDEP ASTCP and it was uh, uh, financed through the, uh, and it was contracted to Dominion through Army Corps of Engineers who was acting as a uh, uh, contracting officer. Dominion, uh, after they were uh, assigned or the, the project, they were, uh, they were responsible for designing, procuring, and installing all the equipment at uh, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. Uh, once the project, the project took almost a year to be implemented. And uh, once it was done, uh, the verification of results was, uh, was started by Dominion and their staff. And, uh, and, and, and of course, I should mention that the, 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 the this reduction applies to Henderson Hall and part of Arlington National Cemetery, which are on the same grid uh, coming from our uh, in-base uh, substation, which feeds uh, Fort Myer, Henderson Hall, and also part of uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, the project was installing f uh, four sets of three uh, each, uh, 12 regulators, automatic voltage regulators, on the circuits that's coming from our Radnor Heights substation, and uh, uh, which regulates the voltage based on the readings that they get automatically from Dominion's installed smart meters at the uh, entrance of each building. Uh, the uh, results are shown uh, on the uh, on the four circuits that we have, and shows how much sa savings we have had on the uh, on each circuit that we have, and uh, which ranges anywhere from close to three percent to four to five percent. Uh, Measurements and verification were completed uh, for the winner uh, uh, IPR and DVP provided ESDCP program office with original CVR range and estimates between 0.6 to 1 uh, and DVP statistical MMV report resulted uh, closely uh, with this range. Uh, a summer CVR factor for each circuit has been calculated and confirm. Dominion's experience that uh, summer CVR factors are often higher than winter CVR. And of course, our next presenter, presenter uh, will be giving more information on this data. We have verified ourselves, independent from Dominion, the uh, measurements and verification as to the savings that we have seen on, uh, on the project. On the, uh, Four projects that we have on Circuit 568, we show approximately $30,000 of savings. On Circuit 569, about 13,000. On Circuit 570, we have $28,000 savings. And uh, on Circuit 571, we have about 18,000. And overall annual savings that we had for 2017 through 2018 season was about $91,000. Uh, the validation team 
the validation team was uh, uh, was done here using the uh, uh, using the Army Corps smart meters. Uh, we would be reading uh, occasionally, periodically, the voltages at the destination points, and by measuring that versus the uh, or the, the 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 bus voltages we would be able to calculate the reduction in voltage into the percentages of energy reduction, which came to about, as I said, to about close to $100,000 per year. Uh, one thing that uh, I should mention is that uh, without having the Army Corps uh, smart meters, it would have been difficult to validate independent from uh, the Dominion Energy, uh, the savings. Uh, so it is essential that someone who is going to implement this project to have uh, independent uh, smart meters on their installations at the various uh, destination points to be able to read the actual voltages that the loads are receiving uh, and compare that uh, uh, with the bus voltages which is usually in excess of the load voltages after the uh, controllers take uh, take over the uh, voltage reduction. And for additional information, please uh, uh, visit the uh, HTTPS CERDEP ESCPC or, uh, dot org program areas. And thank you for your patience and. Uh, your 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 interest. Thank you so much, Cyrus. Um, as a reminder to everyone, you may submit questions by using the Q and A box on your screen. We have received the number of questions that we're gonna pose to Cyrus, starting with the following: um, What can you tell us? in terms of what you learned about the distribution system during your project demonstration? Well, the distribution system we had was, uh, has been in place and renovated uh, in the past uh, seven or eight years. And really, the distribution system is, is comprised of multiple transformers. And each transformer serves one or several buildings uh, in, in, in our garrison. And uh, that's why we were able to uh, be, be able to read uh, each, uh, read the, uh, each transformer's uh, output to the buildings and, uh, and, and, and uh, calculate the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, calculate the uh, c reduction in energy that was there. Great, thank you. Um, what recommendations would you have based on your study uh, for other locations that might consider implementing conservation voltage reduction efforts? Well, first of all, make sure that you understand your own system and make sure that you have enough uh, knowledge about the, where your energy is going, is being spent. We will understand what kind of loads you have, whether they are all uh, reactive loads or some reactive loads like uh, chillers, uh, air handling units, uh, or huge motors, because that will sort of uh, have effect on the uh, on the capability and on the efficiency of the voltage reduction. Obviously, if you don't have too much of a uh, reactive loads, uh, this project is really, really uh, of interest, should be of interest to you. Uh, and of course, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, you should have an independent way of uh, trying to uh, rationalize uh, the reduction that is going to be suggested by uh, your utility provider. That's great um, advice. Thank you so much. Um, can you comment 
on what is involved in installing smart meters to that level that would be required to read the voltages? Well, the smart meters that are uh, installed on us, it's all done through Army Corps of Engineers. They are meters that uh, uh, read both, not just electric, but also the water, gas uh, consumptions. And it's, it's, it is an online, uh, independent from our IT system, because it, uh, whatever it is, it was not, we were not capable, we were not allowed to connect to our IT system. So it's independent uh, from that, and it is displayed on a uh, ongoing, uh, minute by minute, on a certain uh, station, uh, computer station in our uh, facilities here. Uh, this was, as I said, it was done through a contract between Army Corps of Engineers and uh, uh, awarded, I believe, from MCOM. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to hear about the results of this project from Bruce in just a little bit, but can you share with us how you independently verified the results of this project? Uh, when I read the 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 the, the voltage at the each load center or destination point, if the voltage which was running effectively without any disturbance to the uh, uh, to the equipment, if it was running, let's say, continuously at 100 and 12 volts, 113 volts, rather than 120 or 120 volts. Of course, this ratio uh, it was a number to be converted into power, and this is how I could confirm that we are using less power because less voltage meant less power. That's that's how I calculated the reduction in our uh, in our energy. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question from Fort Jackson. Has there been any studies of long-term effects of lower voltage on appliances? Well, uh, the, there shouldn't be that much of a uh, 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 that much concern because each manufacturer usually uh, provides a range of plus minus some percentage for the uh, for the best operation of their equipment. So if we are confined to that range, which we are, uh, we shouldn't really see any uh, kind of uh, uh, reduction in the efficiency or in the life of the equipment that is being uh, served. It's not like uh, every equipment has to be running at 120 volts because no manufacturer provides something that rigid. They always provide a plus minus percentage around the uh, nominal voltage that if the equipment is running in that range, there should not really be any problem with the life of the equipment or damage to the equipment. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question from Al Cyber Defense. Can you speak to the cybersecurity of the US Army Corps of Engineers smart meter? Well, I know that uh, we had uh, several years of delay in installation of the uh, project uh, of the uh, smart meters by Army Corps, and that was because of the, the changing of the regulations of the DOD's uh, network enterprise that uh, uh, that went through several modifications, and finally we had to go with independent. Uh, independent circuits not really tied to the uh, DOD uh, uh, or our garrison's uh, computer system. That's why we have a independent uh, monitoring station that m monitors the voltages of these uh, uh, b different buildings. It cannot, it, 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 it is really difficult. This was the one of the points that took us three or four years to get this Army Corps smart meters installed. Not they were installed, but to be operational. 
that's a, that's a sticky and hard point. I'm sure it is. We have one more question for you before we transition to Bruce, and then we'll pull you back in to the final Q&A, Cyrus. But okay. um, last question from um, the current Innovative Solutions. Is the CVR recommended to be installed mostly in facilities with the backup generators to account for a dip in voltages during heavy load conditions? And does it need continuous monitoring if installed otherwise? Well, uh, even though our garrison has uh, quite a number of uh, uh, local isolated uh, backup generators that are used in case we lose power, but none of them have uh, enters into this picture. They, uh, we, we don't use the local generators as a, shave, as a peak shaving devices, so uh, we never turn them on. They are automatic only if we lose bus power, bus voltage. Uh, so I really don't know how to answer this question. Uh, basically, this voltage reduction reduces the uh, voltage. It might affect the uh, the peak, uh, the peak shavings, it might uh, reduce it as well since it's an ongoing, uh, it's, it's ongoing. This uh, savings, 3% uh, also affects the, uh, uh, the, 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 the maximum the voltages of power at, every, any, at any instant. Thank you, Cyrus. This was really fascinating. At this point, we are going to go ahead and transition to Bruce, um, who will deliver the second portion of today's um, webinar. Just a quick introduction uh, to Bruce. Uh, Bruce brings over 20 years of experience in various analytic and leadership roles within Dominion Energy. Prior to joining Dominion Energy, uh, Bruce worked in federal procurement operations for both the Departments of Energy and Defense. At Dominion Energy's affiliate, Dominion Voltage Inc., Bruce combines his years of acquisition experience, analytical skills, energy market, regulatory knowledge, and understanding of the voltage control characteristics to determine the feasibility for Dominion Voltage's edge voltage control solution for electric distribution system operators. Bruce earned his bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary and his master's degree in business administration from the Virginia Commonwealth University. Bruce, please proceed. Uh, Rula, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Bruce Ansley. I was the project lead for Dominion Energy. Uh, we're a large company here based in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, today, I'm gonna share the results for the Advanced Conservation Voltage Reduction Project, which we did demonstrated at Joint Base Henderson Hall, uh, uh, Meyer Henderson Hall, located in Arlington, Virginia. But before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank Cyrus, uh, Tim Tetro, and the support staff from the ESTC Program Office for organizing this webinar. Uh, there's a lot of work that went into organizing this event. I really appreciate the opportunity to share the project uh, with a broader audience today. If we could move to slide number 30, we'll talk about some areas we're going to cover within my presentations. I'll begin with a brief overview of the project and introduce CVR. Um, CVR is not just another acronym for your Rolodex. It's actually a common acronym used in the industry for, to describe conservation voltage reduction. I'm going to share uh, Dominion Energy's technical approach about how we use both CVR and micro CVR technologies to demonstrate voltage control. Micro CVR is a new concept, but it's simply a building level application designed to deliver even greater voltage precision to a premise delivery point. Next, we'll talk about different use cases for CVR, share the demonstration uh, project's results, and finish up with some concluding remarks. Uh, let's move to slide number 31, where I'll begin with the project overview. Dominion Energy was selected to demonstrate two adjacent voltage control technologies. The first technology was CVR, which provided for voltage control across the four circuits at Fort Myer. And the second technology, micro-CVR, utilized a high-speed, low-voltage regulator 
to control and deliver voltage to building 421. And we delivered that in a more precise manner. What's unique about this demonstration is it involved the interaction between two technologies, one controlling the voltage delivery on the primary voltage system, with the second technology serving a specific delivery point on the secondary voltage system. The combination of these technologies had not been demonstrated anywhere in the United States, and the project was designed to showcase how these technologies worked in a compatible manner at the installation. As we move to slide number 32, there were some performance objectives required by this project. The key, objective, the key objectives for the project were established, and they included first and foremost targeting safe voltage reduction, leading to energy savings between three and 6%. The demonstration more importantly, could not disrupt mission performance at the installation. As we review the results later in this presentation, I hope and I think you'll agree that we hit our target successfully. Let's introduce uh, CBR on slide 33. Conservation voltage reduction is, a ba is based on a well-established energy conservation method that has been studied since the 1980s. Most electric loads will respond to decreases in voltage by consuming less energy. That response, that's the relationship between voltage and energy, is expressed through a CVR factor, which quantifies the percentage reduction in energy attributable to a percentage reduction in voltage. The amount of voltage reduction available on a circuit is governed by the end user customer voltages. The American National Standards Institute, ANSI, standard C84.1, specifies a target range of plus or minus 5% for service voltage. This equates to the range of 114 volts to 126 volts on a 120 volt scale for service delivery voltages. Service voltage is defined as the voltage at the point of common coupling, which is typically, typically the meter base. Most loads run more efficiently in the lower half of the ANSI band, resulting in CVR savings. Leveraging voltage data from smart meters provides near real-time voltage information, allowing control systems to precisely control service voltage. As we move to slide 34, we'll discuss the project's technical approach to putting these systems together and see how we're able to deliver energy savings to Fort Myer. As Cyrus mentioned in his presentation, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall is served by four circuits fed by Dominion Energy's Radnor Heights Station located in Arlington, Virginia. Dominion Energy is the privatized owner of the electric distribution system at the installation, as well as the installation's energy supplier. The company began the demonstration on July 5th of 2016 and ran voltage control operations through June of 2017. For the record, the project actually started well before the voltage control operations period began as we were collecting voltage and system usage data, the baseline voltage and energy and provide an estimate for a preliminary energy savings target. We wanted to make sure we had the measurement system in place so we could compare usage before and after CVR and micro CVR were implemented for a year. Another objective of the, the micro CV, another objective, the micro CVR voltage variation testing was implemented to demonstrate the high speed, low voltage regulators reacting and correcting high variable load placed on building 421. The test was conducted successfully in the first quarter of 2014. Uh, the full report that's provided on the ESTC website provides greater detail on this test. Let's move to slide 35. Dominion Energy will provide the voltage control operations and the system year round looking to provide voltages in, as near as possible to the lowest allowable voltage. Again, the goal of this demonstration was to position each circuit in the best possible voltage delivery position using metered delivery points as a starting point for the control solution. We wanted to determine the energy efficiency which could be obtained with these technologies. Let's look at a more detailed diagram on slide 36. Hopefully the engineers in the audience will appreciate the technical schematic we've included in the presentation. 
If you look at the upper left-hand portion of the schematic, you'll find the Radnor Heights station. Just, out the, at, just outside the station, Dominion Energy installed 12 single-phase voltage regulators, a bank of three for each phase on each of the four circuits. Each bank was configured in a gang configuration using the B phase as the leader and A and C phases as followers when it comes to voltage control. Each bank was also tied into Dominion Energy's distribution management system, which provided the set point recommendation generated from EDGE, Dominion Energy's voltage, voltage control solution. As you move across the top half of the schematic along the primary feeder, you'll see services coming off the feeder to buildings. These buildings have smart meters. Those are the green ovals that show AMI, which stands for Advanced Metering Inf Instrumentation. That's the industry's name for smart meters. The dashed green line lines represent the voltage feedback loop used to initiate the control algorithm used by EDGE. EDGE processes the voltage reads and sends set point recommendations to the voltage regulators, enabling voltage control described in our approach. As you move to the lower right quadrant of the schematic, you'll see the micro CVR approach where the low voltage regulator is operating using monitored voltages and feedback located inside building 421. The voltage feedback was sent to a monitoring station inside building 215 on a fiber backhaul line installed by Dominion. From this building, the CBR and micro CBR performance could be observed in real time by the Dominion Energy team. Let's move to slide 37 to examine the micro CBR control scheme. This schematic depicts the micro CBR technology. Here is the building level control scheme using a Solatec I-Volt high-speed low voltage regular known as the LVR. The LVR technology settings were initialized based on what we considered an engineer in the loop feedback taken directly from six second interval reads received from remote sensors that were installed in the basement equipment room near key load centers, as well as on circuit breaker panels located on the first, second and third floors of the building. These remotes collected and injected a digital signal on the conductor where it was received outside the building, processed, and sent to building 215 for storage in a database. Prior to engaging the low voltage regulator, the premise level voltage, which is the premise level voltage control, Dominion Energy collected and analyzed delivery voltage at these locations to give the company a better visibility into the breaker panel, breaker panel delivery voltages. This gave us greater degree of confidence that the end use delivery voltage were sufficient for loads inside the building. This is represented in the lower half of the schematic above, as it shows the lower voltage range within this building as you move further away from the voltage service point. Next, we'll discuss the voltage control solution using another non-engineering graphic found on slide 38. As we discussed, the goal of CBR is to lower the voltage to end use customers and to achieve sustainable energy savings. This graphic represents a, yet another view of the AMI-based control scheme found in Dominion Energy's voltage control solution. This is a typical radial circuit illustrated here with the traditional voltage control equipment based on a substation, downline cap banks, and voltage regulators. The green dashed lines illustrate how voltage measurements from a select set of bellwether meters, which were developed during a planning process, we use them to provide the required feedback for the voltage control algorithm. CBR is a slow process, folks. It runs at a preset interval, typically 15 minutes. It's like watching paint dry, and you might have something more enjoyable to do than watching CBR work in motion. It is able to lower the voltage by comparing AMI meter voltage data to these preset targets and adjusting the settings of the voltage control devices to keep the meter voltage near those targets. The blue dashed lines on this graphic represent the set point control recommendations generated uh, by the system. The advantage of this control scheme is it gives distribution operators direct visibility of the voltage to the customers if AMI has already been installed. It can leverage in a cost-effective manner, the ability to deliver sustainable energy savings without changing customer behavior. That's the great thing about this. In fact, as we move to slide number 39, this control scheme can be implemented to use other use cases 
for distribution system operators. Voltage control solutions are now being used to accomplish a range of objectives designed to create various value outcomes. The three operational approaches to voltage conservation, sometimes referred to as volt VAR optimization or VVO, demand reduction through the form of voltage reduction during peak periods, the industry refers to this as demand voltage reduction, and the third operational approach is voltage stabilization. Under voltage stabilization, the system operator's goal is to keep the circuit stable to mitigate impacts of distributed generation, namely that caused by photovoltaic power systems. Each of, these, each of these approaches drive different value outcomes, and those outcomes are driven primarily by local wholesale and capacity conditions that may be present in that, in that area. For the purpose of this project, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall targeted CVR savings. As we move to slide number 40, I'd like to share the results of the demonstration with you. The ESTP, ESTC project office required Dominion Energy to find measurable, quantitative, and qualitative objectives for this project. The first two objectives hit to the core of the performance, and that was getting energy savings. The first objective, Dominion Energy set an aggressive energy savings target of 3% for the base. And fortunately, we were able to deliver 3.7% energy savings at the installation. The second objective was tied to the micro CVR technology serving building 421. Dominion Energy targeted a 1.5% reduction in energy and was able to deliver 5% reduction in energy at the delivery point. These are pretty solid results for this project, considering we had to set aside time during operations to turn the system on and off to permit proper measurement and verification to occur. I would encourage participants who want, who want to be more curious about how these results are, were formed, you know, please download the full report from the ESTCP website. We provide uh, more detail into how we conducted the measurement and verification which produced these results. As we move to slide number 41, there were two additional quantitative objectives associated with the micro CVR technology that related to voltage stability. The micro CVR technology needed to demonstrate how the LVR could quickly and effectively adjust the voltages due to high variable load shifts outside the building while maintaining the low voltage regulator input and output within a set control band. This test was designed to produce the same effect that transient clouds have on PV systems commonly found in the Mid-Atlantic region. Voltage excursions, whether over voltage or under voltage at a service delivery point is an operational concern for distribution system operators. Having a low voltage regulator solution, which provides high speed, steady state, voltage variation bandwidth control, namely staying within 1% of a set point, is critical as typical primary voltage regulation equipment does not react fast enough to handle localized voltage swings. In this instance, the demonstration showed that the micro CVR unit was able to stay within a set point band and react to voltage within 16 milliseconds. It was pretty impressive to see how quickly the thyristor switches were able to adjust delivery voltages to building 421. As we move to slide number 42, I wanna share some other mission critical metrics that which were designed in the demonstration objectives. First and foremost, we wanted to make sure this voltage control system operated in the background and that Cyrus's team at the DPW would not be getting voltage complaints. If Cyrus was being notified, that our, then our privatization team would obviously be getting a call. During the last two weeks of this demonstration, we did get a call from a customer whose equipment appeared to be bringing a voltage down for the entire circuit. Dominion Energy and the DPW team investigated the event and found that some of the customer equipment was actually having problems. It was addressed by the customer once it was brought to their attention and no further action was required. The second qualitative objective for this project was not to interfere with base security. The construction and deployment of the CVR and micro CVR system was well coordinated to minimize the security impact at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. As we reported, zero, zero issues occurred 
and we were able to continue to focus on our mission while the base focused on, focused on its. As we move to slide number 43, I'd like to offer some concluding thoughts about the demonstration's performance and what's happening with the electric utility space with respect to voltage control. In the last few slides, we just covered the performance results for the demonstration project, and Cyrus was able to quantify about $100,000 of annual savings for his installation. That estimate was consistent for the project runtime savings that Dominion Energy calculated. I want to point out that if EDGE was able to run around the clock and not be turned off for measurement purposes, I estimated that the installation would be looking at a 4.3% year-round savings. And that's generating closer to what we estimate $120,000 $120, per year. And please note that, that that excludes any demand value or capacity charge reduction that related to the company's capacity charges at the installation. This project demonstrated a fairly compelling case for both technologies, but the CBR technology, because it's serving a broader area, drove the bulk of the energy savings for the base. As we move to slide number 44, we, can, we concluded that even the micro CBR technology even beat our expectations for the demonstration. We were able to isolate the savings calculations for the building and show that the additional premise level savings could be delivered without interfering with the tenants in the building. Combining these technologies showed that they are compatible with one another and that each technology offers the Defense Department some alternative solutions to achieving energy reduction goals without adversely, adversely impacting mission performance. This leads me directly to slide number 45, where the two voltage control solutions can deliver benefits to the Department of Defense. Both technologies can work without any change to customer behavior. CBR just works slowly in the background, and micro CBR stands ready to address voltage excursions at a high speed for individual delivery points. As voltage conditions change due to connected load on a circuit, the solution provides some clues to continually assess the health of the distribution system. Dominion Energy can now monitor uh, performance health and take corrective action based on how the voltage control solution responds to changes on the circuit. With, it, with increased PV penetration and the rising interest in carbon free energy, these technologies can be deployed to mitigate the unintended consequences of placing large amounts of distributed resources on a circuit. Let's move to slide number 46, where I'd like to acknowledge the team that made this project happen. Here is a list of suspects responsible for making the magic happen at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. As you can see, there was a considerable coordination across various areas of our company and with folks within the Defense Department. This list is woefully incomplete. And you'll note that some of the key players in, that enjoyed this project so much, they decided to retire just to have to avoid reporting on this gem. Thank you for your time today. It's been fun. If you like my presentation, my contact information is at the back of the presentation. If you didn't like it, please call one of these folks on this list. Call the guys that are retired. Thanks again, and I'll turn it back to the ESTC team uh, for questions. Good one, Bruce. If you have any questions, contact Bruce. The following phone number and the two email addresses included here. We have a lot of questions for you, Bruce. Are you ready? Let's go. All right. Question from Fort Jackson. What types of equipment and appliances are most sensitive to varying voltages? Okay. Uh, there was a study, the uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs actually did a study uh, which actually examined uh, changes in energy based in changes in voltage. Um, the, from a, uh, from a CVR perspective, resistive load is, is uh, and I'm talking like water heaters and things like that, or is challenging because all it does is that stretches out the energy that's used over time. The same amount of energy is going to be used with that type of load. Um, but as you move into some lighting, uh, lighting has very good CVR factors. We found that residential customers, residential um, have, has, have good CVR factors. Uh, we found that uh, normal uh, air conditioning loading um, uh, actually works very well with CVR. Um, the circuits that 
were uh, where the CVR was run at Fort Myer had a wide array of, I'll call them rate classes. There were residential housing that's there. There are uh, small commercial industrial customers. And then there were some larger uh, PX uh, exchange facilities. Uh, there were barracks, mess halls, uh, clinics. Um, so uh, the, the one thing that we look at is we want to serve voltage in the lower half of the uh, ANSI band. We want to deliver voltage to a level that allows for any type of equipment to, to work better. Um, so there, there isn't any one particular type of equipment that works, works better. You know, there are differences in CVR factors, but our goal is to, is to provide better voltage to that delivery point and how, where it goes from that point back into the ultimate use that's a that's a function kind of behind the meter that uh, we're learning more about, to be honest with you. Great, thank you. Another question for you, please. Um, what happens, this is also from Fort Jackson, uh, what happens if the grid experiences a voltage sag? Okay, the so if there is a voltage sag that happens, the equipment, the controlling equipment um, that's at these stations. So uh, most of those detections will happen um, at, the, at where it'll be detected first will probably be at the substation. A voltage sag, the local equipment at that point in time, the local control equipment that runs three to four seconds at high speed, that local equipment, uh, the load tap changer controllers will pick up that sag and automatically adjust and the solution that was implemented at Fort Myer respected that high speed correction that was already built in with the normal uh, equipment. Uh, we actually send a set point and we wait 15 minutes, but any uh, voltage, bag, uh, voltage sag that happens on the distribution system is picked up and handled by that, the, that control device. Our system is not designed to react that fast. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is a question from the Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. Uh, is CVR more applicable to lightning system than one based on electromagnetic output, say electric motors or um, et cetera? So the, the, the issue here on motor loads is what voltages are they being served at and how heavily loaded are they? Um, and, and so there's kind of a little four, kind of four quadrants that you look at. Um, if you have a motor that's heavily loaded, uh, pretty good chance um, and it's, it's being served at within the range, there's probably not a whole lot of opportunity uh, for voltage savings. But what we found is that when you look at when the motor's not loaded, um, or you have a lower, it's, it's not lowered and it's being over voltage, that higher voltage basically turns into excitation losses uh, within the equipment. And that's really what we're targeting is the, uh, the excitation losses that, that happen behind the meter. Um, and like I said before, our, our goal here is to serve the most, the, the, the lowest possible voltage that's acceptable to the equipment that, that's on on the circuit. Um, you know, the ANSI range has an A range, which is typically used for residential, and there's a B range, which is even lower uh, for, for industrial customers. So we're staying well within those ranges. The goal here is not to drive voltage down to, to it's, it's the lowest acceptable point that the circuit will allow, not the lowest point. So um, draw those distinctions because I know the loading, that's a, that's a concern people have typically on on motor loadings, and you know, we, we work uh, not only at Fort Myer but across the United States with a lot of circuit diversity, and you know, we're not we're not seeing those problems on on heavier loads. Great. This is uh, this is a question um, from uh, the uh, U.S. Corps Marine Base, Camp Butler. Uh, and the question is as follows. Do you have to modify the AMI recording frequency from the usual 15 minutes to seconds or every minute 
to acquire more accurate data. So our our system works with uh, so so the two steps back. Smart meters can be configured to deliver different types of voltage information. We work with whatever voltage information a meter is able to provide. Um, there, we are not trying. Our system is not designed to react to every twist and turn that happens on the circuit. We'll react to it if it's sustained. Um, there are uh, within the ANSI bands, there are you're allowed to there there are instantaneous excursions which which are allowed. What we're trying to do is use uh, a bellwether set of meters so that we're not being influenced by one piece of equipment. We're trying to distribute uh, the impacts of where that circuit could actually go, and we're going to use that into our algorithm. And we're making a decision every 15 minutes. The reason why we want to do 15 minutes is we're, we're, we're kind of trading off two issues here. We do not want to, one, react to everything that's happened in the circuit because it's far more expensive to burn through a load tap changer, burn through the taps on a, on a transformer by reacting to everything on a high-speed basis. If the system wasn't designed to do that, what we're trying to do is move into the, the best position where we can hold the circuit for the longest amount of time based on the intelligence we're getting at those smart meters. So that's really why we're not trying to, the granularity of the meter read won't change the impact. If you want to read every five minutes, that's fine. That's a, that tax is a communication layer. What we're looking to do is simply make a decision every 15 minutes. A lot of those decisions are, are, is do nothing, stay right where you are. So, and we have a CBR is a slow moving position. You know, we, we won't transition a circuit. It takes about four hours to transition to, to a position in the circuit. So increasing the meter reads, doesn't really necessarily change the outcome for us. Great, thank you, Bruce. This is a question from the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command. It's two parts. Was the grid bridge the only device used for voltage reduction? And also, what is the mechanism used for these devices to reduce voltage? Okay, I'm gonna ask you to repeat the first what first part of the question again? Yeah, was the the grid bridge the only device used for voltage reduction? Uh, there is a commercial project a project out there called GridBridge. The product that we used at this installation was a Solatech iVolt. Um, that's I'm assuming you're referring to the micro CVR technology. Uh, the micro CVR technology. Um, there are different types of uh, transformers and, and technologies that are out there um, that can handle the high speed movement. The, in, in this particular instance, the, the Solotech iVolt uses uh, thyristors, which are just switches that provide for uh, very high speed switching to, to deliver voltage stability and, and to react very fast for that. So I think that answers the first question on the device for the micro CVR. The, on the CVR side, we're using traditional equipment. Our solution was designed to work with what the distribution operator has. It's load tap changers, it's gonna be cap banks, it's gonna be voltage regulators. That's the primary voltage control equipment that, that, that's out there serving on the primary voltage system. So that's the, there's my response to the first part of the question. Give me the second part. Yes, sir. The second one has to do with the mechanism used for these from these devices to, to reduce voltage. So what is the mechanism used from these devices to reduce voltage? Okay, so, the, so the, now we're talking, I'm gonna assume the mechanism, you're talking about the algorithm. Um, the algorithm, we're, we actually do some calculus. We're gonna take that voltage read and we're gonna do some things with it to make sure first and foremost that it's a good read. Um, we'll run it through filters and then we're gonna process it and say, okay, given um, where the device is, where the load tap changer is, that's kind of at the, the feeder source. And given where the delivery point is, that's the actual AMI meter itself. We're actually calculating a, sl a voltage slope. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive um, the, all the devices and we can coordinate any midline device into blocks and zones. We'll break a circuit down in blocks and zones to allow coordination between, between different devices to first flatten it and then lower it. That's really, that's really a volt VAR optimization. Now at Fort Meyer, they didn't have any downline devices. So it's simply the, uh, the, uh, the line regulators that we had, the CL7 regulators 
getting uh, feedback from uh, the meters on that particular circuit. So it's that's really the the mechanism. It's the, the, the control scheme that actually starts from the delivery point, which is the voltage meter. It doesn't. And and what we do is that feeds our engine, and we 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 use a set point recommendation. And uh, I want to draw a quick distinction on the set point recommendation because the set point recommendation is something that sits outside of a working queue on a control device. We do not penetrate the local control on the high speed. So what that does is that the reason why we, we, we demonstrate that if that communication fails, that device, the control device has a local control settings that it automatically goes to. So if all of a sudden there's a communication interrupt, interruption, it goes right back to local settings and we keep chugging along. We just don't have voltage control. We wait for communication to come back and then we get back at it. So that's an important uh, distinction because some people are concerned that you could have a rogue uh, tap. We, we want to avoid that. Great, thank you. Um, can you provide details on the system economic uh, analysis? For example, the cost of implementation of CDR versus savings? This is a question from the Florida Gulf Coast University. Okay. Um, it, it's, I'll, I'll share this with you. For this particular project, we had two technologies that were combined. So to me, it's, it's how do we allocate and separate the two technologies? Um, you know, the, the, the voltage control technology on the CVR side is, is, is a function of whatever the, how the integration would work. Um, if we're integrating in a, so at, at Fort Myer, the integration was with Dominion Energy and we're using their distribution management system. Um, and that's, you know, that's a function of whatever the integration points that are in there. Um, if there are downline devices and other things we need to worry about, then that's probably additional time. So it's, it's very hard um, to quote what it could look like um, uh, without having kind of more uh, fact pattern. But here, I'll, I'll use this general rule. Um, energy efficiency programs run between two and four cents, and that's kind of a, an industry, industry metric. Um, our product and our installation, we try to beat two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, for larger installations where you've got better, uh, bigger throughput, uh, that number drops down probably to a pen and a half. So uh, from a proxy perspective, those, those are the type of co costs we try to target. And that's looking at that over a 10-year view, which is how other energy efficiency programs are, are uh, measured. So that's probably the best answer I can give you with that having specifics. Sounds good. And maybe one last question for you before we pull in Cyrus. Can your technology be implemented in areas where the power system is not owned by Dominion? And this is quite a question from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. The answer is yes. We work with distribution operators. Our solution is actually um, with uh, uh, 17 other utilities um, and to the extent it, it the, the question that I'm always asked is it, that's along the same lines it, it always revolves around who owns the voltage control equipment and who has the meters and and how would you know how would the implementation work I, I will share with you that that's one of the things I'm working right now is to try to find pathways to get the technology to the market uh, we do have a, um, you know, our servers, you know, we, we can set up and install um, our solution and we can actually install the, um, we can partner with folks to install the, the equipment and, and develop basically a closed, route, closed loop control system anywhere they want to do voltage control. The one challenge that we have is, is really understanding the uh, risk management framework um, and, and that's kind of where, where I'm kind of exploring um, the next couple months here to, to see exactly how we can transfer the technology. We know it works. It's been demonstrated both at Fort Myers as well as um, out in the industry. There's the body of evidence is, is overwhelmingly uh, supportive of the technology working. Uh, it's simply a matter of you know, how do we work through uh, the challenges that people have about security. We, we take security very seriously here at Dominion, and uh, our system was designed to be compliant with uh, NERC standards. So um, we're aware of that, and, and 
And again, I just want to remind people, Cyrus has got a tough job. He's got the Joint Chiefs on his base here. And uh, we make sure that we're staying out of people's way, just doing our thing from a, from a security perspective. Thank you. And talking about Cyrus, I, I'd love to pull him back into this discussion. Uh, Cyrus, for your installation, are you planning to keep the system in place after the demonstration is completed based on the benefit provided by the system? And if so, what would be the additional O&M requirements should installation maintenance workforce um, expect? And this is a question from Marine Corps Base Camp Butler. Well, if you have uh, noticed, I did not talk about the micro CVR in my presentation because micro CVR is a, uh, eventually it has to be maintained. Uh, first of all, it's a very highly uh, maintenance equipment because, and since we don't have the manpower to maintain it, and we, uh, that's why we have decided not to use, not to keep the micro CVR system, which was installed in our barracks building for 21. Uh, so that is out of question. It's a highly uh, expensive uh, for us we, uh, to maintain. We don't have the manpower, the knowledge, the capability of maintaining it. And, and it, so we have abandoned that portion of the project, although it did show its uh, uh, it, its uh, effect in, in reducing additional voltage in the building level. And we are trying to keep, uh, we are in, in fact intending to keep the actual CVR portion of it. The equipment on the uh, CVR, uh, which was uh, paid by DOD, CERDAP, uh, and contracted uh, to Dominion through the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, it has been transferred to us free of charge. So we have all those equipment, and our next step is to privatize these equipment. Since we are our utility, electrical utility system is privatized, uh, therefore we are going to also privatize these equipment, uh, transfer it to the uh, uh, for, to Dominion Energy, and of course. By transferring that, they we we have to pay them a monthly O and M charges, which we figured it will be less than the amount of energy that uh, we are saving. So it's going to be a plus uh, cost savings for us. So that we are, uh, and since it is uh, privatized, it's going to be transferred to Dominion. Then we don't have to worry about maintaining it. It will be maintained along other privatized uh, systems. Uh, by the menu. Thank you so much, Cyrus. Uh, Bruce, would you like to add anything to that? No, uh, just along what Cyrus had said here is is the um, the line regulators, the, the, the Cooper CL7s that are installed there, um, they're on our distribution system. So we're going to go ahead and uh, keep the system operational. Uh, one of the things we're working on right now is we're moving uh, the servers uh, where the solution is here at Dominion Energy, we're moving them from one location to another. So um, we're in the process of transitioning to, to keep the technology available to Cyrus and his team. Uh, along the same lines about the, the Cyrus is talking about the micro CVR ER technology. Uh, the technology is, is, is really, really interesting. Um, the challenge for us in, in trying to uh, accommodate um, the maintenance on that is it's, it's a technology it's, it's it's based over in London um, and to try to um, uh, you know develop do the maintenance on, on that particular piece of equipment uh, especially since you're getting the savings from the CVR system the, the CVR system is kind of cannibalizing what that particular unit uh, could offer uh, Fort Meyer and that's that's a function of the rate structure that we have here in Virginia, um, uh, that we've got cheap rates here and, and trying to make the economics work just didn't make sense uh, when you combine that with uh, uh, managing the technology from a, from a maintenance perspective, because that would roll into our privatized contract, so we'd have to be warned about that piece of equipment for the next 50 years. The one thing we did like about the, the piece of equipment, though, is, is if you think about the application, if the economics are right for a particular building, 
that particular technology can scale up and that can be uh, another can be investigated outside the service territory because that equipment uh, can be you know you can install that it's actually uh, uh, it's built for an interior position you can actually take that technology put it inside the building so you don't have to worry about the environmental issues that we had to deal with uh, in the humidity up here in the mid-atlantic you could actually bring that technology in house and you can actually enjoy the savings on a very precise basis that technology is, is very impressive and, and um, provides a lot of savings and that savings should be captured without having um, a no voltage control solution working on the primary if the if certain uh, military installations or federal installations are interested in, in um, kind of looking at that technology. Thank you. And, and given what you've said, Bruce, um, how can we increase adoption and utilization of this technology at military installations? Well, I, I tried to address this earlier. Um, again, we're, we're examining different paths here to get the technology to the DOD market. Um, I think part of this thing here is, like I like like I stated before, I'm going to be on a little bit of a journey here to try to understand the risk management framework. Um, but I also want to take that journey to to kind of communicate how our solution design is designed with kind of the fail the normal operations. All right, the idea is we're going to have a conversation about risk. I know there's a risk of bad actors interfering with installation energy systems. Um, we have filters that protect and guard us against that, which would allow actually to go to, to local control for our devices if they want to do the solution. But uh, to get it, to, to work on the expansion, one of the things that we're going to be looking into is um, how do we start um, looking at business cases? Can, can we allow economics and the technology to work together in, in to, to actually work on a, on a business case specific uh, uh, project for uh, military installations. Again, that those economics are gonna be facts and circumstances specific based on whatever wholesale powers in the area, whatever whatever the rates are being charged from their the local serving utility. And more importantly, what's gonna be happening in those capacity markets, because I, I think uh, that's really gonna be the driver in my mind in the next 10, 15 years is as we transition from uh, as a nation from one fuel source to a, a mixed bag of other fuel sources. So th that economics is kind of going to weigh into the, the adoption rate as far as I'm concerned at a, at a kind of a national level. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Cyrus, do you, would you like to weigh in on this question? Uh... I can't really add any more to what uh, Bruce said. So, uh, and I really uh, don't have that much of uh, insight into this. So, uh, I guess I'll just let Bruce's explanation uh, be it. Sounds good. And then, uh, just to kind of wrap up, uh, Bruce, what are the next steps in continuing to evaluate and implement CVR, if, if there are any? So um, one thing that uh, I'm looking into is uh, actually working on uh, kind of an economic development tool. Um, that's the one thing that uh, I'm currently uh, starting the process with the ESTCP program office to establish an economic development tool that can be used by uh, the, the local staff to basically do the same work that would be provided in a preliminary audit, uh, gather information, see whether or not there's a, we want to look at the, uh, the kind of the technology footprint, obviously look at the local economic footprint there, um, and develop tools that can kind of start the process to see whether or not it's a go, no go decision. That's really where, um, where I'm going to be working with the ESTC program office to try to develop a tool that can be shared so people can start the process of seeing whether or not it's a good fit and see whether or not the economics are compelling. Um, so that's kind of the next steps for, for me and uh, next steps for analyzing CVR. We do have a, a plan here hopefully to expand within the Dominion Energy footprint on those privatized basis, but uh, that's kind of a work in progress. Um, we'll hope to have uh, more, more to talk about in that area here in the next couple of years. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bruce. And thank you, Cyrus, for very interesting uh, content here. Um, at this point, uh, we'd like to wrap up. But before we do so, I would like to remind you that our next webinar is on Thursday, March 14. Uh, it will feature two speakers, Dr. Feldman from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Professor Wang from Old Dominion University. Um, these speakers will discuss their work on de determining the temporal and spatial scales of non-stationary temperature and precipitation across the continental United States. Registration, as Tim mentioned, is open for this webinar and other webinars. So please visit the CERDEP and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and future events. Um, before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would, we would appreciate it very much at this time if you could just take a quick moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.